Sixers lock all windows and doors. Scott Fransky, 19th season with the Fightins. I love it. You sound great with Kevin Stocker. Of course, your relationship and your chemistry with Larry Anderson. It's one of Philly's lore. We're going to talk about that. Dallas born, but you're Philly, my friend, through and through. Mary Delory, son Gus, the twin daughters, Loretta and June. You're going to be, you don't look it, bro. You wear it well. 52 in March. Scott Fransky, welcome to Fresh 24. Glad to be with you. Good to see you, Zoo. It's good to be seen, brother. It is good to be seen. You came to Philly at 34, and I'm just trying to imagine maybe a little culture shock. The Hall of Famers, uh, well, at least we hope so, and we'll talk about that. Jimmy Rollins, Chase Utley, Ryan Howard, Shane Victorino, Carlos Ruiz. You're in the same booth as the Hall of Famer, the late Harry Callis. Give me your mindset coming to Philly at the age of 34. I was terrified, but my first week on the job, I got a call from a guy named Mark Zumoff. He left oh, me a message here we go. <laughs> and uh, told me what a great town Philly was and uh, welcomed me to town. So, no, it was um, – yeah, it was kind of uh, the the Harry thing was really surreal. Um, I not I wasn't a Phillies fan, so I wasn't really uh, tuned in to you know who all these guys were coming up uh, necessarily at the time. Uh, but I knew all about Harry, and mostly because of NFL films um, and his work in the NFL. And, uh, so I was very familiar with Harry, and I I still vividly remember uh, one of my first games on the air. We're in. Kissimmee, Florida, doing a Phillies Astros spring training game. And Ryan Howard hit a home run the third or fourth inning. He and I were on the air together at the time. And Harry did the out of here call. And, uh, you know, the chill bumps start on my neck. And, and I, I just kind of pinch myself. I'm like, man, I'm sitting next to Harry Callis. What happened? Uh, how did this happen? But, uh, yeah, I've been very fortunate. It's been a fun ride. All right. I mentioned it. From the 2008 championship team, Jimmy Rollins, Chase Utley, Hall of Famers? Uh, sure. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, Jimmy's got a lot more longevity. He's got a lot more of the counting stats. Uh, I think they play favorably to some of the other, uh, you know, players uh, in, in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I thought, you know, a guy like Barry Larkin getting in a few years ago uh, certainly was uh, good for J. Roll's case. Um Utley was as good as I've seen, you know, for a five-year stretch there. But uh, I'm not – I don't know. I mean, the, the voters like him. Uh, the war stats like him. Um, uh, you know, in, for, in terms of my Hall of Fame, the guys I've watched, he's he's right there, tops among them, for sure. Well, in the words of Harry the K, we got high hopes, my friend. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, okay. Three years in minor league ball, you had a couple of stints, I'll call them peripheral stints with your hometown team, the Texas Rangers. Uh, to what do you owe your relatively rapid ascent into the big leagues? Uh, I mean, I don't know, luck. Uh, I, I mean, I'm really fortunate. I had some good people uh, to help me along the way. Uh, you mentioned my time in Texas, and they have some had some great broadcasters there that uh, not only did I grow up listening to, but ended up getting a chance to work with and, and learn from uh, up close. So that helped. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can't, you know, there's so many good at the time, you know, you look around the minor leagues and other guys that were doing it at that time. And there were a lot of great announcers and uh, guys who really knew how to do it. But um for whatever reason, uh, the people doing the hiring in Philadelphia, uh, my sound matched what they were looking for, I guess. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, a, a lot of that is luck. I mean, obviously, once I got here, I had the, the good fortune to be paired up with Larry. That's, you know, you know, from from doing this kind of work, um, you don't get to pick your partner and uh, to be, you know, 
stuck with Larry uh, right away, you know, turned out to be probably the greatest thing uh, for my career because um, not only was he fun to work with, uh, we got along well together. It seemed to mesh well on the air. And um, yeah, so um, a lot of... uh, a lot of it's luck. I mean, I, I'm not saying I didn't try hard or work hard or or, or try to get better along the way, but uh, in this business, sometimes luck uh, has a lot to do with it. You're right about being paired with a partner. It's like an arranged marriage. Why is it that you do have the chemistry that you have? What is it about you and him that meshes so well? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think from a, one standpoint on the air, uh, we both have um, kind of a similar way of of the, of the way we want to do a game, uh, a similar way that we think the game should sound. And I mean, I think this we definitely have a similar sense of humor, um, and, and I think that helps. Um, but you know, it, it really is. It's one of those things that's just sometimes you can't necessarily put your finger on it or explain it in a great way, but. Um, but I think by and large, uh, it has to do with, uh, because we, because we see a lot of the same things and, and, uh, view the game the same way, uh, and, and want the game to sound a certain way, whether it's a, a three to two game in the eighth inning or a 12 to two game in the eighth inning, uh, those games have very, very different sounds to them. Uh, but we both kind of respect that and we both kind of follow the same template, I guess, if you will. So we're not stepping on each other. We're we're trying to complement each other as best we can. And uh, I think uh, in this line of work, that's uh, probably the number one thing you get to do. And uh, honestly, you go back. Uh, I, I always think back to when I got hired. And uh, they said to me, they said, look, we have this guy. We think he's the funniest guy in the room. Uh, but we don't necessarily think it always comes out on the air. So that's what we want you to do is bring that out of him. It was it was actually incredibly uh, refreshing for me to worry about that more than I worried about sort of myself and the call and the, the, the play-by-play part of it. I really focused on trying to get the most out of Larry. And I think that really helped me be more relaxed and settle in. You know, kind of the game takes care of itself in a lot of respects. Well, I think that's one of the things that makes you great is the fact that you do care about your partner, which to me uh, lessens the chance of having the battle of egos on the air. But what I want you to do is take me back to your childhood and describe family life for little Scott Fransky. Uh, well, yeah, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> grew up in, uh, as I said, I grew up in Texas. My, um, my parents were not from Texas. Uh, my dad um, was an executive with IBM, kind of moved around a lot and uh, landed in Texas uh, shortly before I was born and uh, kind of put down roots there and and um, and and you know, never left. You know, um, I, I had a brother. Uh, Mom passed away when I was young. My dad remarried and uh, she my stepmother kind of helped uh, raise us. I was, you know eight years old or whatever, when they got married. And, um, so, uh, she had two kids of her own. So we had kind of a mixed, mixed household, if you will. And, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of different personalities trying to, to mesh and, and, um, but I, you know, I was just a, a you know, an average kid, I guess. Uh, did like you play the, sports at all? Did you play did, sports? Yeah. I mean a little bit, especially when I was really young, played baseball and played a lot of soccer when I was uh, really young. And, um, you know, uh, kind of drifted away from, from that and got, um, I got into a lot of like technical stuff. I was, you know, I got interested in music. I got interested in sort of some of the tech stuff. I, it, when I was a senior in high school, I worked for a recording studio for a while mm-hmm. and, uh, kind of looked at that, uh, line of work. And, uh, I was just, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I did not have this idea that I was going to be a sports announcer. That's something that didn't come along until I was in college, quite honestly. I mean, I always so, liked sports. But so when I and how never, did it – I was going to say, when and how did the broadcasting bug finally bite? In SMU? Yeah, I was at SMU, and I, I was a basic radio TV film major. And um, I uh, had to write a, a – a, 
an article for the school newspaper, just as a class project uh, or intro to writing project. And they said, you can make it, do it on whatever you want. So I just called the, the sports information office. I actually think I just called the basketball office and I said, can I interview the coach? Um, John Shoemate was there at the time. And uh, I just went in and did like a profile on John Shoemate. And in the process of doing that, you know, the interview and the writing and everything else, I kind of thought to myself, oh, this is, this is a profession. People do this for a living. <laughs> um, and I really, really enjoyed writing. I really enjoyed that, that, uh, that time that I did writing. And I even continued that after school. But I, I did switch to become a broadcast journalism major along the way. Um, I, I, I basically, it was basically kind of the same thing. I, I, um, I was interested in sports and broadcasting and giving it a try. And I went to the campus radio station, which wasn't much to speak of. It wasn't a big, you know, like schools today, they have these great radio stations. They have all these great outlets. They also have a lot of competition because everybody wants to do this job. I walked up and asked the guy, hey, is anybody broadcasting the basketball game this Saturday? And he said, no, do you want to? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I want to give it a try. So I took the equipment and I set it up and, and started doing games. And, um, you know, with SMU being in Dallas, uh, I they just said, like when winter break hit, um, I was the dorms are closed, but I could live at home. And they said, here, take the equipment and do all the games you want to do. And so I just go down to press row, plug in and start doing basketball games. What was it like being live on the air for the first time in your life? Well, I think because I knew there probably weren't a lot of people listening. Um, yeah. It wasn't as, as terrifying as maybe it should have been. Um, but, uh, yeah, we uh, it, it, it was, you know, for me, I, I was always sort of a consumer of those, you know, of the Mark Zumoffs of the world. I mean, I knew. Um, I knew who Alan Stone was. He did the Mavericks, you know, for, for years. And he was doing SMU games then. Mm. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, man, I'm sitting right next to Alan Stone. You know, this is like so great. And, um, you know, all the different guys that had come through town, you know, whether it be working uh, on the Cowboys broadcast, you know, uh, going way back to like Vern Lundquist and, and uh, people like that. Um, there was a guy named Frank Gleber who did stuff with oh, the yeah. Cowboys way back when. And uh, his son, actually, Mitch Gleber, was a wide receiver on the football team. And I hmm. think he might have been the only player to stay at SMU pre and post death penalty. Um, wow. And he stayed and finished out his schooling at SMU rather than leave and go to another program. I want to go back to being live on the air because for me, it was the ultimate buzz. It's the, one of the things that I do miss. It's, you know, essentially you're walking a tightrope without a net, but it has its risks. How do you navigate the thrill versus the perils of being live on the air? Uh, you mean the perils of just saying something stupid? <laughs> exactly. And how many times did I do that? Plenty. Yeah, I mean, it's always there, I guess. Um, you know, there's there's something to be said for the pace of baseball. I think that in a lot of respects allows you to slow things down and try to maybe be your own gatekeeper. Uh, you know, if I was in a in a faster sport, you know, like like doing basketball on the radio, I can't. That's that's a recipe for me. That'd probably be a recipe for disaster. But uh, this allows yeah, but you, me. To you, you, you know what, Scott? I'm also visualizing you. It's like the dog days of the season. It's the sixth inning somewhere. You got to lose your concentration or something. You know what I mean? Where you're sure. just you're. What am I saying? Like your your brain and your mouth aren't in gear for that for that short segment yeah, of time. Yeah, I mean it, it. It no doubt it happens, and and. Um, it's one of those things you tend to watch. I mean, you watch your energy level and you, you, you sort of have to be cognizant of that internally, unless you have somebody out there who's really good at listening to you and is really willing to kind of, you know, come and tap you on the shoulder and say, Hey, look, you know, let's, let's pick it up a notch or something. Um, but yeah, 
it absolutely happens. Um, we have enough breaks, I think, that you can even feel it. If you feel it happening, you can take the next, you know, half inning break and sort of, as Larry might mm-hmm. say, shake yourself uh, <laughs> and, uh, and get back on track. Uh, this is a Sixers centric podcast, and so you, uh, you know, I have to ask you about my favorite team. I know you're a fan of all sports, uh, so I have to imagine Mavericks growing up. What do you remember about the Sixers growing up? What do you think of them now? Um, Allen Iverson is always an interesting talking point. Just give me your Sixer thoughts. Yeah, you know, I mean, not uh, not being a huge uh, NBA guy, I, I just never, I just never really followed it. I, I sort of. When I was very young, I did. I, you know, the Mavericks were were kind of a new thing during the '80s in Dallas, and and um, they they never could quite push past you know L.A. and and uh, in the West or whatever. Although they had some good teams down there, they did, they did, and they 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 were always kind of a there was always the soap opera drama, you know, the the the, the tragedy stuff with you know Roy Tarpley and and. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I still think, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I haven't lived there in so long, but you, I'm pretty sure if you still bring up the name Rolando Blackman or Derek Harper or something like that in Dallas, Fort Worth. Great backcourt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, still pretty good uh, tandem there. And uh, I was a big Mark Aguirre fan. Um, you know, he was a pretty good player for a while. And, you know, again, there was a lot going on there, I think. But, uh, uh, but just as a kid, I, I followed those guys. You know, as far as the Sixers, I mean, obviously Iverson for me was um, the 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 one you know about as a as a sort of a casual na- national fan, if you will. Um, but uh, I, I will say, when I was we were house hunting a few years ago, and uh, we bought a place and. Uh, in Gladwin and we were looking at the place, the guy there who owned the house, he said, yeah, you know, it's pretty quiet around here. You know, it was a little noisier a few years back when Iverson lived nearby. (laughs) (laughs) He said, there was always helicopters flying over. (laughs) Um, Obviously I love basketball. It's my favorite sport. What do you love about baseball? Uh, I do like the pace. I like the rhythm. Um, I like uh, the way you know, big moments happen in the first and they happen in the ninth. I, I like the way, um, I, I like the way the season builds for me, the, the, the baseball season, um, a, a lot of ways. And I've thought about this before, talked about it before, um, you know, baseball broadcast in particular on the radio, uh, you can look at almost every season as like a book. Um, and, and it's got its different chapters and it's got his different characters. Some of them are on the field. Some of them are in the booth, right? <laughs> and they sort of weave in and out. Um, and while you try to make every game stand alone and, and be good on its own and know that somebody is tuning in for the first time and you want to make it uh, fun and engaging and interesting for them, you also know there's people there that are that are there day in and day out. And um, they follow those characters too, you know? Um, they're part of... Uh, they want to know what's going to happen next as well. So um, I, I kind of like that. I like the way the rhythm goes and I like the way, we, you know, certainly when the team is good, the way it builds towards the end. And and um, and then just the postseason is just a totally different animal. Yeah, for sure. Well, we're going to talk about last year. We'll look ahead to this year. Uh, we're going to relive Bedlam at the Bank. And um, uh, to me, it's one of the finest moments in Philadelphia sports history. And you just put it together so well. So we'll talk about that. Uh, But now it is halftime. And that means that I am going to present this or that. It's brought to you by our folks at Garage Beer. It's our Garage Beer six pack of questions. I'm going to give you a choice between two things and you have to provide the answer. Are you ready? I'm ready. (laughs) All right. Just to pay the bills here. Our Garage Beer six-pack of questions is brought to you by Garage Beer. It is beer-flavored beer, Scott. Mm. Find some near you at drinkgaragebeer.com. Here we go. So, you ever get to a game and your view is nothing close to what you thought it would be? 
Listen, I get to buy seats now, too. No freebies. So I'm teaming up with Game Time. They have got killer last-minute deals, flash deals. You could check out views from all seats in the venue, and they've got your back with the lowest price guarantee. Listen, if you find tickets for less in the same section and row, Game Time credits you 110% of the difference. They show your total up front. No surprises at checkout. Buying tickets takes two seconds, a couple of taps, and you're done. Philly, let's change the game. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, use the code ZOO for $20 off your first purchase. Remember, terms apply. Redeem the code ZOO, Z-O-O, for your $20 discount at GameTime.co. Philly I prefer my beer to taste like beer. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole thing. Philly cheesesteak or Philly soft pretzel? Cheesesteak. Center City or South Jersey? Center City. Gritty or Philly fanatic? <laughs> Philly fanatic. No disrespect to Gritty. Of course not. Meek Mill or Hall & Oates? Uh, my son is way into Meek Mill, so we'll go there for him. Okay. And listen, I know you're not a huge hoops guy, but... Dr. J throwback or Allen Iverson throwback? Mm, I'll go really old school, Dr. J. All right. Liberty Bell or Rocky Steps? Liberty Bell. All right. That's our six pack of questions brought to you by Garage Beer. Beer flavored beer. Find some near you at drinkgaragebeer.com. It is time now to delve into my music library. You had mentioned that you had gotten into music particularly uh, when you were transitioning high school to SMU. All right, Monfreer, I'm going to give you a handful of artists from my music library. You tell me if you have them in yours or not. Are you ready? Okay. ZZ Top. Uh, they're not. That's but, a yes or no, Scott. <laughs> but I will say they were one of the first concerts I ever attended. ZZ oh. Top, Eliminator Tour. Uh, t- t- try a few Try a few songs. They're pretty good. Tom Petty. Yes. Weather Report. Uh, no. Jazz Fusion, really good. Sturgill Simpson. Absolutely. You too. Yes. What do you listen to when you're sitting around in your favorite chair and it's just me, myself, and I? Who's the uh, go-to? I do. Uh, you know, I, I'm being from Texas. I got a lot of Texas artists that I like. Um, at one point, it was it was. Very chill stuff, you know, Lyle Lovett. Um, there's a guy by the name of James McMurtry, son of Larry McMurtry, the novelist, um, who's, uh, I think, just a tremendous artist. Uh, more contemporary would be somebody like Sturgill Simpson uh, or um, Jason Isbell, um, people along those lines. Um, that, that makes up a big part of my listening. Well, millions will claim they were listening on October 23rd, 2022, the Phillies, and we're going to hear a portion of it, the Phillies looking to go to the World Series for the first time since 2009, up three games to one on San Diego. It's the NL Championship Series, but the Phillies are trailing. Bottom eight, three to two. There's a man on with Bryce Harper at the plate. Scott Fransky, how often do people ask you about Bedlam at the bank? <laughs> Yeah, um, that's that's me, I guess. That's what I I, I better like it because I got to live with it. And uh, you know what? We're, we're seeing the video of you and it's not like, uh, well, there's a bedlam at the bank. I mean, it's just it's coming right out of you. Yeah, uh, just I don't know. It's just what hit me. Um, I think I said this. That first week afterwards, I I remember, um, you know, I'm watching the ball go out and and I'm watching the fans and the stadium seems to have this bounce to it. And I remember seeing it. I have a monitor next to me that I can see replays on. And and I just remember seeing the uh, beer flying in the air and and, uh, hands in the air and everybody jumping up and down. And um, to me, they all those hands in the air, they looked like those used car inflatable dudes. That, <laughs> you know? uh, and I don't know, it just came out. So um, 
Yeah, it was. It's definitely something I get asked about, or meant, you know, people mention it to me quite a bit. And listen, uh, you profess to uh, enjoying writing. Alliterations all, always make, I think, good writing. Bedlam at the bank. You know what I'm saying? It, your choice of words there were spot on. Well, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad it uh, resonates with a lot of people. Um, it, it has resonated with people. I, I do think that there's um, there's that element of what we like most about people, people bring up our calls. Uh, but I think what they, what they most want, they say, Oh, I've listened to that, you know, however many times. And I think what they really want is just to be in that moment again. And they want to relive Harper hitting it out again. They want to relieve, relive that euphoria. And, you know, the call is basically the only way to do that. You know, um, they, they can't ever go back to that moment. So, um, Sort of the recording is one way to do it, I guess. And for all those reasons, people tend to remember your calls, the great moment, reliving where they were and their feelings at the time. But I always tell people, yeah, you can announce the game winning shot, but it's what you do when your team is down 35 in the third quarter or you're down 10 nothing, and it's the sixth inning somewhere right. you know, during a Phillies game where I think you really earn your money, where you got to keep people interested and believe it or not, you're self-interested. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm a big Ira Glass fan. Uh, oh, from, yeah. Uh, NPR and This American Life. Yeah. I remember hearing him uh, talk about where they start with their story ideas and, and they, they have their production meetings. And they say they start with the premise of trying to amuse themselves. Uh, <laughs> and, and I've said that so often about Larry and I sometimes. It's like, but it's true. If if we're not interested and if we're not having fun, that's pretty obvious to a listener. And I don't know how I could possibly ask a listener to tune in or to stay with us if we're not going to be fun or engaging or, or try to make it interesting. So mm-hmm. I'm not saying we always hit that mark, but I do always have that in my mind that it's, you know, and baseball's so long and there are so many games that, you know, it's seven to one in the seventh inning. And um, it just, that's the nature of the sport. So, yeah, I do think that's where you tend to earn your money. I mean, I, I think back at, I grew up listening to, to the Rangers on the radio, Mark Holtz and Eric Nadell. And Eric's still there. Uh, hmm. uh, Mark passed away years ago. But but Mark and Eric, to me, made it entertaining, even though the team throughout the 80s was not very entertaining. And um, I think that's why a lot of people loved Harry and Whitey so much, right? They had bad teams for many of those years, but Harry and Whitey still made it entertaining. And I think that's, you know, for an announcer, like you said, uh, we generally all of us can hit the mark on those big spots when, when we're given the chance. Um, and some may be better than others. And I know some of mine are going to be better than others and I'm going to like some better than others, but the, the, the real test of a broadcaster is to do it night in and night out when the game stinks. I always tell young announcers that when they send me their tapes and they send me home run after home run after home run, like that's great. Who are you? Show right. me who you are. To, let me hear what you sound like, because these are great highlights. But this that's not the, all that the game is. In fact, it's a very, very minimal part of it. So who are you? Show me who you are. And I think uh, and we don't have to go uh, too far down this road, but just my opinion. I think uh, a, a lot of young announcers today are coming up cookie cutter where they think that there's a certain sound that they have to have. But I, I, I want to stay with um You sliding over occasionally to TV. You know, I love your colleague, Tom McCarthy, the TV voice of the team. I love him for his um, his versatility, his ability to really do almost any sport. And he does that with football, college basketball. You will occasionally slide over. And yet it's my impression that you prefer the relative anonymity of radio. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. Um, I've always um, I mean, uh, at least for baseball, and I can't speak to other sports, but I think at least for baseball, it's definitely – it's just a different way – it's a different way you have to do the game. Um, and I prefer doing it on the radio. I've always preferred – I've always 
said, first and foremost, I want to do playoff games. And the radio guy gets to do the playoffs. And whether that's right, wrong, or otherwise, that's the way it is. And that's what I want to do. I want to be, I want to be the, I don't want to do all 162 if I don't get to do the playoffs. I just don't. Um, it's, it's, to me, the playoffs are the reward. I know other announcers talk about it. They're like, well, do you get paid extra in the playoffs? I'm not, I'm not going to the playoffs for the money. I, I'm doing it because it's, it's the most fun in this business. Um, that there's just no question about it. In the last two years have sort of reaffirmed my belief uh, along those lines. Now, as for doing TV, um, it's not something I would seek out to do, but, uh, you know, Tom takes those games off and, and, you know, has uh, some tremendous opportunities to go to the NFL nationally and things like that. And so when we talked about it, I said, you know what, um, as long as we're clear that this is not, this is not my passion or my pursuit, um, I think it'd be a fun challenge for me. Um, and I think that's the way I've tried to look at it. And it has been a real big challenge because I don't, uh, it's a, like I said, it's a totally different way to do the game. And whereas radio might be a play by play guys medium, television is an analyst medium. And, um, you know, I mean, what am I going to do? Talk over John Cruck? How stupid would that be? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I and you know I said this to you. I, I thought uh, your instant chemistry with him was remarkable when you slid over and did some TV. But um, I, I, again, I just think it's a credit to you who you are as a human being, and I think that you really showed your humanity in May of 2022 when 19 students and two teachers were fatally shot at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. It's about a six-hour drive southwest of where you grew up in Dallas. You were moved at that time to write an essay about it, totally unrelated to baseball for sure. Give us a thumbnail of what you said, and maybe more importantly, why you said it. Uh, well, the, the the first part of that, the thumbnail was just uh, that you know we've got issues, we've got a we've got a problem uh, in our country, and and. Um, we can blame a lot of different facets and factors, but uh, the reality is they're probably all uh, contributing factors in some, some way, shape or form. Um, and, and I don't want to, I didn't set out, I didn't want to get political about it. That wasn't my intention. I'm, I'm not uh, overly political, if you will. Um, it's not something I would stand up on my soapbox to do, but th this was a case where, you know, just too often uh, kids are, are, um, the kids are dying for no reason at all, none. And, um, so, uh, my, my, my ask was maybe just find a way to help. Maybe there's a way they can help. Even if, if, if people who think it's not a big gesture, um, little gestures can mean a lot too. And, um, uh, so that, I think part of it for me was, you know, we were on the road at the time and, um, a lot of the premise of the essay kind of revolved around my one of my daughters, and uh, or she was mentioned in, in in the essay, if you will. And, and I think not being home with them at that time, and and sort of not being around my family then, led me to sort of put this on paper. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, could I do this on the air? Would would I, would they let me? Um, and so we, you know, I asked some opinions and, and um, we decided to go with it. How do you manage that being away from your family? Um, as mentioned, you have three children, a boy and twin girls. Uh, the dichotomy is, of course, you got one of the greatest gigs in America. The bad news is you're away when the kids are off in the summertime, no less. How do you manage that? It's tough. Um, you know, my kids don't know any different. I think that's been uh, helpful, if you will. I mean, it's not as though they lived their life one way and I was around all the time. And then I started this job and, and took off. You know, they were born on the job, if you will. Um, so they've grown up around it. Um, uh, but it's it's challenging. I mean, it's a lot. And, you know, thankfully, Technology today allows us to stay closer than ever before, even though we're physically not in the same space. 
you know, you and I couldn't have done this kind of interview, you know, five, 10 years ago, you know, if, right. I mean, mm-hmm. it, the, the landscape has changed and, and I still remember, you know, the first year my son was born, um, I'd get my dinner in the press club, sit down, you know, seven, seven o'clock game. I'd sit down at my desk, six, put the iPad up and watch my kid eat, you know, and I, I'd, mm. I'd be on screen eating with him, uh, in a way. Um, but it's hard. I, I think it takes, um, it takes a lot to stay connected to all of them, you know, to, 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 to stay connected to what it is they're doing, what's going on in their lives. And, and now they're starting to get a little bit older and into teenage years and maybe years they, you know, they have questions and, and want to know more or want to be around you more. Maybe they want to be around you less, who knows? But, um, but, but I think it's, it's, it's a constant struggle to try to stay close. And, and some of that means, look, I'm going to just pay for my own flight, my own way to Milwaukee so I can stay home for an extra day or whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's just, you know, I, I've watched, I watched Tom navigate it, you know, McCarthy uh, for a long time. And um, he's one of the most uh, involved, you know, um, loving dads I've ever seen in action. Um, And to watch him do that for those years, uh, you know, I think that was maybe inspirational was too strong of a word, but certainly um, instructional. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Scott, we're recording this at the end of January, and I remember when I did Sixers games, there was clearly a rhythm to the season, both in season as well as out of season. At what point do you sort of like wash away the previous season and begin to look forward to baseball again? Hmm. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're a team that's terrible, you wash it pretty good by the second week in October. You're you're pretty well done. You might have been done in August, quite frankly. <laughs> um, if the team was good and they had a run in the playoffs, you know, this past year was tough. Uh, I think so many people felt uh, obviously felt like the Phillies were a better team and they got beat by a lesser team, and that stings. And um, so it takes a while to for that to to rub off, and then you get into the holidays and you're just kind of focused on that. I I start. It's really it's right about now when when I start sort of zeroing in on what's ahead um, and, and what spring training looks like, and, uh, what my travel might look like and how many games I got to do and, you know, what the team looks like and, and, and those kinds of things. So uh, I'd say around about now is when, when we start, you know, um, start thinking about it. Well, let's look back at 23 for the simple reason that it's a way to look ahead to 24. The team has two chances at home to get to the World Series again only to lose to Arizona. What happened, or better yet, what can the players, the coaches, the front office learn about what happened and better prepare for 24? Yeah, what happened, I I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's a cop-out to just say baseball happened. Um, You know, um, they didn't didn't put up offensive numbers like they thought, um, and that happens sometimes, and... and, uh, I I don't know that there's any, you know, for me, there's never any just one thing that, that costs quote unquote costs you in a baseball game. It's um, that they're obviously an accumulation of events from the first pitch to the last out and um, decisions that are made by managers um, uh, execution or lack thereof from players. um, They all go into it. And I know, you know, fans were fans go back and they look at, um, you know, Rob Thompson, his bullpen usage in, in, in the other games, uh, the ones in Arizona, you know, those, those two games. Well, I mean, he's followed pretty well the same script a lot, a lot of that way. And he still came home with two games to win at home, you know, two chances and, and, you know, couldn't get it done. So, um, I, I don't know what happened. I think, I, again, like I said, I think in some respects, just baseball happened. Give us the Phillies opening day lineup, the batting order, and what position they're playing. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be a lot like last year, uh, the way they ended the season. I think it will shake out. Um, 
I think Schwarber's still going to lead off. I know Rob Thompson has made the the point that uh, you know he's looking at all options and and that sort of thing. I have a hunch he would still lead off. You know, Turner and two and DH, and DH yeah, mm-hmm. Turner two, Harper three, um, uh, maybe Bohm four again. You know, um, mm-hmm. maybe JT. Um, mm-hmm. One of those guys would be behind him, I think. Um, you know, Stott will be at second, Bowman will be at third. You know, again, knock on wood, all, all everybody's healthy. Um, I think Rojas still cracks the lineup in center field, and I think Brandon Marsh is in left. Um, By the way, and, did I see a did I see a jacked up Johan Rojas on social media? Uh, I don't know because I'm, but my son told me uh, that yeah, he's we he was my son was kicking my butt at MLB the show the other night. <laughs> And uh, he told me Rojas was was uh, I guess working out with Ellie De La Cruz and and you know that they're buds. I don't know. Yeah. I get I get all my information from Gus now. <laughs> Listen, I, I know you're a long way from calling it a day, but to this point, Scott Fransky, could you ask for a better life? No, no, I'm super lucky, and um, in all respects, uh, to. to when when you when you try to become a major league play by play announcer, um, you're not going to split hairs over where you're going. You, you're just going to go. If somebody will give you the opportunity, you have to take it. There's only 30 of those jobs or whatever it is. Um, and not only did I land in a great, uh, you know, with a rising team, a good team, a great partner, a city where the fan base cares. Um, I mean. Say whatever you want, whatever you want, day in, day out about the Phillies fans or Philly fans, you know, whatever sport, they care. And like, what else could we ask for? They can be mad or they can be happy, but they care. And we we see markets all over the place where the fans don't care. They might come to a game and buy popcorn and buy some souvenirs or whatever. But they don't care like Phillies fans do, and I'm not saying there there's not others that rival them, but I, you know, they're certainly among the best in the world uh, in terms of a, a sporting fan base, and and I, I just can't imagine. Everybody likes to plant their flag, but I can't imagine a fan base cares more than the one that we've got here in Philly. Amen, brother Scott Fransky. You're the best. Thanks for joining us here on Fresh 24. My pleasure, Zoo. Good to see you. Check out our friends over at Philadelphia Sports Nation, a local Philadelphia sports site covering your favorite teams across blogs and social media. PHLSportsNation.com. Philadelphia Sports Nation. PHL Sports Nation. Enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode of Fresh 24. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts.